A vector quantity has magnitude and direction. This contrasts with scalar quantities, which have magnitude but not direction. Examples of vector quantities include velocity, displacement, and acceleration. Scalar quantities include speed, distance, mass, and temperature. Vectors can be represented using arrowed lines, the lengths of which are proportional to the magnitude of the vector quantity. The direction is that of the vector. Vectors cannot be added together without their direction being taken into account. To add vectors together, the parallelogram law can be used. In the diagram, vector A is added to vector B to give the resultant vector R. It is frequently convenient to draw only half of the parallelogram, in which case the vectors are added head to tail. It is necessary to be able to answer vector questions using either scale drawings or mathematical equations and a sketch diagram. Graphs can be used to represent and calculate the motion of a body. There are two commonly used types of graph, velocity time and displacement time. The gradient of a displacement time graph tells us the velocity of the body. The gradient of a velocity time graph tells us the acceleration of the body. The displacement of a body can be calculated by finding the area under a velocity time graph. Thus, to find a body's displacement from a velocity time graph, the area is calculated. Or, to find a body's acceleration from a velocity time graph, the gradient is calculated. The graphs shown here represent a moving body with a constant velocity and a stationary body. The graphs shown here represent the motion of a body accelerating and a body moving with a constant velocity. You should already know that for an object travelling with a constant acceleration, Acceleration equals final velocity minus initial velocity over time. In A-level physics, you will only have to consider situations where a body's acceleration is constant. There are three equations which can be used in reference to these situations, which enable us to calculate components of their motion which were previously unknown. It is essential to know and be able to apply these formulae. They must be learnt. A body falling directly to the ground, with no force acting upon it apart from gravity, can be said to be in free fall. If, during the time in the air, the body also has a horizontal velocity, it is said to have projectile motion. The horizontal and vertical motions are totally independent of one another. Therefore, no matter what the horizontal velocity of the body, it will always take the same time to reach the ground. If thrown horizontally, the object will have a horizontal initial velocity of u, a vertical initial velocity of 0, and a vertical acceleration of g. The exact path of a projectile is determined by its initial velocity and angle. If a body is thrown from the ground at velocity u and angle alpha above the horizontal, the initial horizontal velocity is u cos alpha, 
and the initial vertical velocity is u cos 90 minus alpha, or u sine alpha. Usually, the acceleration of a body is or can be taken to be constant. However, this is not always the case. The same rules for graphical calculations apply to graphs which show non-uniform acceleration. For velocity time graphs, the body's acceleration can be calculated by finding the gradient of the tangent of the graph at a given point. For distance time graphs, the velocity can be calculated by finding the gradient of the tangent of the graph at a given point. Newton's first law states that an object continues in its state of rest or movement with a uniform velocity unless a resultant force acts upon it. Newton's second law states that the rate of change of momentum of a body is proportional to the resultant force which acts upon it. For an object of constant mass being pushed by a constant force so that its velocity increases from u to v in a given time, Newton's second law tells us that the force is proportional to the rate of change of momentum. We already know that A equals V minus U over T, so we can say that F is proportional to MA. The equation for motion now becomes F equals KMA. K is a constant with no unit whose size depends on the unit to be chosen for the force. The value of k is set at 1 by defining the unit of force as the force which would give a mass of 1 kilogram an acceleration of 1 meter per second squared. We can therefore say that for a fixed mass, F equals ma.
The momentum of a body is defined as the product of its mass and velocity. The unit of momentum is kilogram meters per second or newton seconds. It is a vector quantity and its direction is that of the body's velocity. Simplistically, it could be said that momentum tells us how easy or how hard it is to stop a moving object. When an object is acted upon by an external force, its momentum changes. Newton's third law tells us that when two bodies interact, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other. If no resultant external force acts on a system of objects, although the momentum of the individual objects may change, the total momentum of the system remains constant. The total momentum of a system remains constant, providing no external force acts on the system. In collisions and explosions, the principle of conservation of momentum can be stated as total momentum before equals total momentum after. Newton's second law states that the rate of change of momentum is proportional to the total force acting on the body. Energy is defined as the stored ability to do work. The release of energy does work, and doing work on something gives it energy. Energy and work done are equivalent quantities. Work done is equal to energy transferred. This is not easily calculated, but in situations of motion, it can be stated as work done equals force times distance moved in the direction of the force. Work done is a scalar quantity measured in Newton meters, or more commonly in joules. One joule of energy is the work done when a force of one newton moves its point of application over a distance of one meter. It is important to note that when considering work done, only the force in the direction of the motion counts. If a trolley is pulled at an angle, only the horizontal component of the pulling action does any work. There are many different forms of energy, including heat, sound, electrical, kinetic, and potential. Kinetic energy is an object's ability to do work as a result of its motion. Gravitational potential energy is defined as the ability to do work as a result of an object's height. The principle of conservation of energy states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, although it may be transformed from one form to another. This animation shows the energy changes in a roller coaster as it goes up and down. Kinetic energy in the dips is converted into potential energy on top of the peaks. Energy changes also occur in cars, where chemical energy stored in the car's fuel is transformed into the kinetic energy of the engine's movement, and subsequently into heat and sound energy. If a body is lifted up, it gains potential energy equal to its mass multiplied by acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the height it is lifted to. If the body is then dropped, its potential energy is gradually converted into kinetic energy as it falls, until just before impact with the ground, all the potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. It is possible to calculate the body's impact velocity. Study the method shown. Energy is needed to change the temperature of a substance. 
the specific heat capacity of a material is defined as the heat energy needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram of the material by one Kelvin. Internal energy is determined by the state of a system and can be defined as the random distribution of the microscopic kinetic and potential energies of the molecules in an object. The internal energy of a gas can be increased by increasing the thermal energy given to its container. The slowly moving gas molecules of a cool gas will gain kinetic energy when they hit the walls so that the molecules vibrate more vigorously. We say that the gas's temperature increases as its internal energy increases. The kinetic theory of gases states that the pressure of a gas is due to the force of the molecules bombarding the walls of the container. When a molecule bounces off a wall, its momentum is reversed because of its change in direction. Newton's second law tells us that force equals the rate of change of momentum. We can therefore say that the average force exerted by a gas is the average rate at which the momentum of its molecules is changed by collision. When considering the kinetic theory of gases, numerous assumptions are made. The gas consists of a large number of molecules. The gas molecules move with rapid random motion. Collisions between gas molecules and the container walls are perfectly elastic. Attraction between the molecules is negligible. The duration of the collisions is negligible compared to the time between collisions. The volume of the gas molecules is negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas. The model used assumes a gas to consist of an enormous number of point masses moving with completely random motion, bouncing perfectly elastically off one another and the walls of the container. Boyle's law describes the relationship between pressure and volume for a gas at a constant temperature. If the volume increases, pressure decreases. If the volume decreases, pressure increases. We can therefore say that the volume of a fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to the pressure applied to it if the temperature remains constant. In a smaller volume, there are more collisions between gas molecules and the walls of the container. This means there are more forces exerted over small areas. As pressure equals force divided by area, this equates to a higher pressure. Charles' law is concerned with the effect of temperature on the volume and pressure of a gas. Volume increases with temperature at a constant pressure while pressure increases with temperature at a constant volume. Charles discovered that, at a constant pressure, the volume of a gas is directly proportional to its temperature in kelvins. Kelvin developed a temperature scale which gave things absolute temperatures. Absolute zero is the temperature at which it is no longer possible to extract any energy from a system. This corresponds to the temperature at which a gas no longer has a volume or exerts any pressure. As ideal gases do not exist, this is a purely theoretical concept. Absolute zero is defined as zero kelvins. Charles also found that the pressure of a gas is proportional to its temperature at a constant volume.
temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules in an ideal gas.
To understand electricity, we need to think in atomic terms. In an atom, each electron has a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Atoms are not charged particles, so for each electron, there is a proton with a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. If an atom gains or loses an electron, it becomes charged and is called an ion. An electric current is the flow of charged particles through a material. The majority charge carriers in metals are electrons, as they are delocalized and free to move. Convention states that current flows from a positive terminal to a negative one. What actually happens, however, is that the negative electrons flow towards the positive terminal in a circuit. Current is measured in amperes. The unit of charge, the coulomb, is defined as the charge passing a point in a circuit per second when the current is one ampere. Current can therefore be said to be the rate of flow of charge. One ampere flows when one coulomb of charge passes a given point in a circuit each second. Electrical circuits are used to transfer energy from one place to another. EMF stands for electromotive force, but it is not a force. It is a ratio of energy to charge measured in volts. The potential difference, or PD, across the terminals of a power supply when no current is flowing is known as the EMF, and it tells us the total energy per coulomb of charge that the power supply delivers to a circuit. Although a power supply primarily delivers energy to a circuit, it must be realized that the flow of electrons through the power supply is actually opposed by the wires or chemicals within it. The resistance inside a source of EMF is called internal resistance. For an efficient energy transfer from a source of EMF to an external resistor, the internal resistance should be small in comparison to the external resistance. The EMF of a power supply equals the potential difference of the circuit. Not all of the energy taken from the supply is delivered to the external circuit. Some is used to overcome the internal resistance of the supply. This energy is represented by what are known as lost volts, and the effect is shown in this hill diagram, where R is the internal resistance. Potential difference, or PD, is a complementary concept to EMF. We can define potential difference as the work done in moving unit charge between two points in a circuit. It is a measure of the energy transferred during charge movement. Resistance is the name given to the ratio between the potential difference across and the current flowing through a piece of material. Resistance is measured in ohms. A material has a resistance of 1 ohm if there is a current of 1 amp flowing through it when the potential difference across it is 1 volt. The resistance of a material can be said to be the degree to which it opposes the flow of charged particles through it. At a constant temperature, this depends on three factors. The resistivity of the material, the length of the material, and the cross-sectional area of the material. Ohm discovered that the resistance of a piece of material is proportional to its length and inversely proportional to its cross-sectional area. Power is the work done per second. It is measured in watts. 
Electrical power is the energy liberated in a device each second. The power dissipated as a current flows through a wire can therefore be stated as P equals I squared R. When there is resistance in a piece of material, the power dissipated is lost as heat. In a metal, resistance and temperature both increase as current is increased. This is because the more electrons there are flowing through a material, the more chance there is that one of the electrons will collide with an atom in the material and surrender its energy. This energy causes the atoms in the material to vibrate, further increasing the chance of collision and opposing the flow of current. The resistance therefore increases with temperature. The resistance of negative temperature coefficient thermistors decreases as the temperature increases. NTC thermistors are made of a semiconducting material. The extra energy of the material at higher temperatures gives some of the electrons on the outer shells of the atoms the required energy to become delocalized. They then form part of the current. When the current increases, the ratio VI decreases, so the resistance decreases accordingly. Ohm's law states that the current through a conductor is proportional to the potential difference across it, providing its temperature remains constant. Ohmic conductors obey this law, and their resistance does not vary with current at a constant temperature. Metals are ohmic conductors. The resistance of non-ohmic conductors varies with current, so they do not obey Ohm's law. IV graphs for non-ohmic conductors may be curves or may not pass through the origin. NTC thermistors and semiconductors are examples of non-ohmic conductors. Kirchhoff extended Ohm's law for systems of electrical conductors. Kirchhoff's first law states that the algebraic sum of the currents at a junction is zero. This tells us that charge is neither created or destroyed. There is conservation of charge in a closed circuit. Kirchhoff's second law states that around any closed circuit, the algebraic sum of the EMFs is equal to the algebraic sum of the potential differences. In other words, the sum of the EMFs is equal to the sum of the IR drops in a circuit. Any energy that charge gains as it moves around the circuit is balanced by corresponding losses. There is conservation of energy. The relationship between currents, potential differences, and resistances varies, depending upon whether the circuit has resistors in series or parallel. Resistors in series pass the same amount of current. Resistors in parallel have the same potential difference because each coulomb of charge flowing through delivers the same amount of energy regardless of its route.
This becomes clearer if we examine the current in series and parallel circuits. In parallel circuits, there is a high current before the junction, then half the current in each of the branches. Both bulbs receive the total energy carried by each coulomb of charge. In series circuits, the current is equal throughout, and the bulbs are each given half the energy carried per coulomb of charge. Potential dividers can be used to vary the output PD of a circuit. They can be used to produce a small PD from a larger one. The larger voltage, V, is connected across two resistors in series. Kirchhoff's second law states that the sum of the EMFs is equal to the sum of the IR drops in a closed circuit. The potential difference across the two resistors therefore equals V. V out is the PD across R2. If R1 is smaller than R2, it has a smaller share of the input EMF. Light-dependent resistors or thermistors can be substituted for one of the resistors. The potential divider can then supply an output PD which is dependent on temperature or light intensity. When light shines on the LDR, or the temperature of an NTC thermistor increases, the resistance decreases. The smaller their PD, the larger the PD across the set resistor R. Potential dividers can also be set up using wire of uniform resistance and a sliding contact. This provides a continuously variable PD and is known as a potentiometer. Potentiometers are often connected to the knobs of television and radio sets, enabling you to vary the picture intensity or volume. Potential dividers incorporating NTC thermistors are used in fire alarms and are also useful for maintaining constant temperatures when connected to heaters. They are used in tropical fish tanks and incubators. A capacitor is a device which can store charge and energy. Capacitors consist of two metal plates separated by an insulator or dielectric. They can charge up during normal use and discharge if there is a power failure. Various materials can be used as the dielectric, including paper, oil, polystyrene or even air. When the capacitor is connected to a battery, electrons flow from the negative terminal to plate A of the capacitor. Electrons flow from plate B towards the positive terminal of the battery at the same rate. As more charge collects, the PD between the plates increases. When the plate PD is equal to the battery voltage, the charging current falls to zero and the capacitor is said to be fully charged. Capacitance is a measure of how good a capacitor is at storing charge. It is defined as the charge stored per unit PD applied to the capacitor. The unit of capacitance is the farad. One farad is the capacitance when a charge of one coulomb is stored per volt applied. It is possible to calculate the energy stored in a capacitor 
if it is remembered that, at all times, the charge on the capacitor is proportional to the PD across the plates. The energy stored by the capacitor is equal to the work done when charging the plates. In the circuit shown, we shall assume that the capacitor is initially discharged. In this case, the voltage across the plates, Vc, equals zero. At the instant the switch contact is closed, the full battery voltage, Vb, appears across the resistor, and initial current equal to Vb over R will flow. Current is charge in motion. The current flowing through the resistor is charge flowing towards the capacitor's plates. The result is that a potential difference starts to build up across the plates of the capacitor. Vc is no longer equal to zero. As there is now a potential difference across the plates of the capacitor, the potential difference across the resistor, Vr, reduces. The current flowing, I, equals Vb over R. The current reduces, but it is still flowing. The potential difference across the capacitor continues to increase. The current undergoes an exponential decay with time. What affects the rate of decay? Intuitively, we can see that if R is big, small current will flow, and the potential difference across the capacitor will build up more slowly. I0 is smaller if R is big, but decay is slower. If C is bigger, more charge needs to flow for a given change in the potential difference across the capacitor. Thus, the larger the capacitor, the slower the rate of decay. A discharge curve can be drawn using CR as the unit of time. Dimensionally, CR has the unit of seconds. Because the product CR is the dimensional equivalent of seconds and affects the rate of decay of the current, it is referred to as the time constant of a capacitative circuit. In one time constant, the current decays to 36.8% of its initial value. In five time constants, the current will decay to less than 1% of its original value. 5CR is sometimes referred to as the settling time of a capacitative circuit. The charge on a capacitor builds up gradually. As it does so, the potential difference across the capacitor increases. Just after the current begins to flow, that is, just after closing the switch, the potential difference across the capacitor increases quickly. As Vc approaches the value of Vb, it increases more slowly. The relationship between the potential difference across a capacitor and the time after charging commences is exponential and adheres to the formula shown here. These graphs show how the current and the potential differences across the resistor and capacitor vary with time in a circuit containing a charging capacitor. It is possible that you could be asked to make time the subject of the equations. A worked example is shown below. A charged capacitor will dissipate its stored energy in the form of heat if it is connected across a resistor. 
if the initial capacitor voltage is VC0, the initial current will be VC0 over R. The fact that charge flows through the resistor means that charge is lost by the capacitor. As the potential difference across the capacitor, V, equals Q over C, it follows that the potential difference across the capacitor will fall. Notice that in this circuit, VC equals VR. Thus, if VC falls, so does VR, and the current reduces. During capacitor discharge, the potential difference across the capacitor, the potential difference across the resistor, and the current all undergo an exponential decay. When a capacitor is charged, there is an electric field set up between the plates. In a uniform field like the one between the plates of a capacitor, the potential difference per unit distance is numerically equal to the electric field strength.